Good morning, Walker Chapel, and everyone who has joined us this morning on this absolutely exquisite day that God has given us. We can feel the Christmas of the air that reminds us that, yes, indeed, it is September. And we're thankful that we have this opportunity to gather in this unique and wonderful way. We trust and pray that today will be a time of worship and reflection, that it will be a time to refresh and nourish your spirits, for we continue in this, what I have said so many times, strange and challenging time. We have some notes this morning, and so I hope you'll take note as we are continuing to pray for those. Um, with whom we've received names across um, the land, if you, if you will, as well as those right here at home in Arlington, Virginia, who are um, continuing to receive treatment, whose bodies we are praying will be healed. We pray for their doctors and all their caretakers. So I know you'll join me in continuing to lift up the names of those who um, are healing there are also a number of unspoken prayer requests this morning. We're thankful that the God that we love and serve hears our prayers, even when we ourselves um, are unable to share them. And so I invite you this morning to be in prayer for those unspoken prayer requests. 
there's um, a number of things going on at the chapel. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Walter Leathers for the prelude this morning. Um, it was beautiful. He um, was on the harpsichord, and we're thankful for those who are willing to share their, their talents with us. So thank you, Walter, for that beautiful gift of music. Today um, at the chapel uh, is a new day uh, after after so many weeks of not gathering at 12:30 today our students are going to gather for a socially distanced picnic bringing their own snacks um, to the meadow we got a special request because our group is rather small uh, we got a special request from our district superintendent so that we can have this small gathering with um, bringing your own snacks our food drive Speaking of snacks and food, it continues from 1 to 3 today, so um, I hope to see you. We have lots of folks who come every week from our community, and we're very thankful for the continued support in our surrounding community um, because there's still folks who are really, really uh, experiencing food scarcity, and we need to do all we can to help. So from five to six today, we're gonna gather back. Bring your chairs or a blanket to sit on, um, your face mask, and um, we previously said bring some snacks, but what we've realized is, oops, not quite yet. We're not allowed to have food together with a larger crowd because that requires us to take off our, our face masks. So bring your chairs, bring your face mask, bring your eyes that are smiling. If you're like me, you've learned to at least attempt to smile with your eyes while you're wearing a face mask. So we're looking forward to this hour together as um, we reconnect um, and have a chance to be in conversation with each other. There are um, several other prayer requests I want to um, note. You, I'm sure, noticed this past week that as we remembered September 11th, September 11th will forever be etched in our minds as a day that our country changed forever and we continue to pray for all those, all of us affected by September 11th, 19 years ago, for all the family and friend who still grieve and mourn the loss of those who died. But September 11th this past week also marked the six months since the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a global pandemic. So one of our prayers today is that we continue to pray for perseverance during this hard time, that we continue to pray for all the healthcare workers, that we pray for those in labs across the land who are working tirelessly to um, discover and work toward a vaccine for the coronavirus. For all those um, out in the West who um, are experiencing the worsening of these wildfires that have destroyed, destroyed um, nearly 7,000 miles with 100 plus major fires, all of those who are experiencing anxiety, who have lost, lost more than they ever imagined for those whose lives have been lost. We pray for their families. For so much that is on our mind, we, we pray for strength and for courage as we continue um, conversations around um, racism, systemic racism, where you and I need to continue to pray mightily to God to help us to see what we need to see, ways that we can um, be more loving and compassionate and just. We'll be talking more this morning about our upcoming presidential election, one of the most consequential in many of our lifetimes. And so I would ask you to also put that at the top of your prayer list for every day as we move forward in the next 50 days toward that time in our lives. I believe these are the notes that I have for us this morning, so I would invite you um, as we worship together to allow that this time be a prayerful time, to be mindful of all the things that are before us, and to prepare your hearts and your minds and your spirit for this morning's call to worship. Good morning. 
My name's Herb Grant and I live in Arlington, Virginia. We're gathered for worship today in places far away and nearby. God brings us together and we're glad you are here. As Walker Chapel United Methodist Church, we celebrate being with you today. Please join me in this call to worship. If you are weary and in search of rest, if you are hurting in need of justice, if you are mourning and long for comfort, if you are perplexed and seeking truth, if you are struggling and you desire a win, if you're broken and need a savior, God welcomes you here in the name of Christ. To the lonely in need of fellowship, to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, to any and all who come, we are open and welcome all in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you for creating this world in all its beauty, for redeeming the world through Christ our Lord, and for sending the gifts of your Spirit to encourage, instruct, and sustain us. We are hurting, we are challenged, we need you. We ask your Spirit to work among us now, to give us strength, to inspire our praise, to challenge us with your truth, and to equip us for action in this, your world. Amen. Good morning, children. I've been thinking a lot about you this weekend, and I know some of you have had an especially busy weekend, and so it's always a special time for us to get to have this conversation together. Yes, we long for the time when we can be right next to each other, but for now, what I want to say is that we have an extra special time together. So I want to also remember to say that I know that Catherine and Ellie and Jacob are actually riding in the car this morning, coming home from Ohio. The Timmons Olson family had yet another death in their family, and so they were in Ohio um, over the weekend um, giving thanks for and celebrating the life of their Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack was the first generation of five generations of Warners, and so yesterday was the time to celebrate Uncle Jack, and so the children wanted us to especially pray for Uncle Jack's family, and also for Mrs. Wright, who um, is in need of our prayers. So this morning, um, we are together and we're going to have a special blessing and so this is this is important for all of us all of us gathered this morning from zero um, to 102 because we're going to have a blessing of the technology now this is a first for me but this is also um, a first for all of us in this strange time but 
I've um, offered many, many blessings over the years, and a blessing is a special giving of thanks to God for something that is important to us. I've even gone and done blessings for people who are moving into houses for the first time as they make a new home. We have blessings of brand new babies. We've blessed gardens, all kinds of things that are appropriate for us to give thanks to God for. So this morning, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give thanks to God for our technology because think about it. Think about it, children who are riding in your car this morning. If we didn't have our technology, we wouldn't be able to be connected in this wonderful way. And so this morning, we want to give thanks to God for our phones. We want to say thank you God for the gift of our phones that allow us to be connected in a really important way, especially in this time when we're not connected in person. So we say thank you God for the gift of our phones that help us to be connected. We also want to give thanks to God this morning for those thousands and thousands of children who are using Chromebooks for their virtual learning. And there are lots of children that have been blessed with these by their parents, but there are a lot of children across our land where school districts and other generous folks have helped put into the hands of thousands of children Chromebooks so that they can learn during this school year. So we want to give thanks to God for our Chromebooks, for our computers, and I'd be lifting up mine, but it's being used this morning for a very important use as we celebrate and give thanks to God for worship. Perhaps you use a Kindle or perhaps you have an iPad that enables you to be connected. So here's what I wanna suggest that we do as we give thanks to God for our technology. You might wanna take just a tiny little piece of paper, maybe a little post-it note on your Chromebook or on your Kindle and write these two words, I am thankful. Because here's the thing, sometimes we forget we get frustrated, our eyes get tired from Zoom, and we need a reminder that all of these gifts help us to stay close to one another during this unusual time. So I make that challenge to you. If you're zero to 92, find a way to put on your devices a reminder to say, because I'm thankful for this blessing in my life, I'm gonna remind myself I am thankful. So this morning we give thanks for the gift of our technology and we pray, oh God, that um, we through remembering our phones will stay charged, that our computer screens will be bright, that our Zoom connections will be strong and that our internet will stay on that our hot spots will be in the places where we need to be connected. And so we thank God for the gift, the gifts of our technology. Let all God's people together say, Amen. 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 Now, children, this morning we have yet another Thanksgiving and a lesson and reminder. And I've found something that I know each of you have at home, even if you are just learning to work puzzles. Um, I know that um, our granddaughter Jubilee hasn't quite started working puzzles yet, but she will. And this particular puzzle is 1,000 pieces. It's a puzzle of Cape Cod, which is a beautiful area up in the Northeast. It was a gift to me by our daughter Annie during this pandemic, but this puzzle is 1,000. But what I want you to imagine is a puzzle that was over 7 billion pieces. 
Can you even get your mind around 7 billion pieces? Because we have over 7 billion people in our entire world. And so the lesson for this morning on the puzzle pieces is that if you think about the puzzles that you have in your own home that you've worked before, you know that they're different, that every piece is different, that some of the pieces are what we might call an edge piece, where it's straight across, it's on the edge. There's some pieces that fit all the way into the middle of the puzzle. And then there's some other pieces that fit in all kinds of different places around the puzzle. But here's the thing, every single piece is important to the entire puzzle. And so the lesson of the puzzle piece for this morning is just like the puzzle, God has created each one of us, all seven plus billion of us, to be connected just like the puzzles connected in a very unique and wonderful way. God has made us so that we are one. And so the challenge of our life is to live our lives in love ever so carefully and compassionately and be mindful all the time that even though we're different, our pieces are different, that we look different on the outside, that on the inside our hearts are made to be one. So this is an important lesson and I would encourage you to write this lesson on your heart. And what that means is to take this lesson and to think about it and to remember it because there are times, many, many times in every day that we forget that God has created us to be one, one in Christ Jesus. So that's the lesson of the morning. Yes, my beloved children will continue to pray for all the things that are on your heart and on your mind. And we will remind each of you that we love you dearly and we're forever proud of you. Let's pray together. Dear God, dear God, help me, help me remember, remember that I am an important part, that I am an important part of your puzzle, of your puzzle. In Jesus name I pray. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen.
In Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul addresses the fundamental reality that simply said, people are different. And because we're different, we're going to see things differently. And we're naturally, yes, naturally going to disagree. Our differing perspectives, the way we see things, can be so divisive that we decide oftentimes that we can't, simply cannot be in relationship with each other. In today's text, written centuries ago, Paul is addressing doctrinal issues, in this case, issues around food, that were so serious they led to disputes between James and Peter, issues that were so full of conflict that many of the people in Rome saw the confusion over them as a basis for denying fellowship with each other. In other words, the disagreements, the conflict, so polarized the believers that they convinced themselves they could not, would not stand each other. Hear these words from Paul's letter to the Romans from the 14th chapter. Welcome with open arms, fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it comes, even when it seems that they are strong in opinions but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own story to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who has been around for a while might well be convinced that he or she can eat anything on the table, while another with a different background might assume all Christians should be vegetarians and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing what the other ate or didn't eat. God, after all, invited them both to the table. Do you or I have any business crossing people off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without our help. Or, say, one person thinks that some days should be set aside as holy, and another thinks that each day is pretty much like any other. There are good reasons either way. So each person is free to follow the convictions of conscience. What's important in all this is that if we keep a holy day, we are to keep it for God's sake. If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. If you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. None of us are permitted to insist on our own way in these matters. It's God we are answerable to, all the way from life to death and everything in between, not each other. That's why Jesus lived and died and then lived again, so that he could be our master across the entire range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. So where does that leave us when we criticize a brother? And where does that leave us when we condescend to a sister? I'd say it looks, leaves us looking pretty silly or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment, facing God. Our critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve our position there one bit. Read it for yourself in Scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, 
Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will tell the honest truth that I and only I am God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And may God teach us the meaning of God's word. Whatever your side or my side, if we see in our lives a controversy that is dividing us from others as a basis to exclude from fellowship or community, then this particular text, these words of Paul's are speaking to us. If we are struggling from being in the same space with somebody else because we see ourselves as simply being too different, then these words are for us. Now, I want to make it clear, because I think it's especially important that, that we say that Paul acknowledges that the need for healthy debate and differing perspectives is a good thing. He does not dissuade us from seeing things differently. But what Paul does do is make clear with God's people that the spirit in which we engage one another and engaging one another is a spiritual practice, the way we engage each other and the way we come at our relationships with those with whom we disagree bitterly, this is the foundational truth of Paul's focus in this text. Theologian William Greenway says that our spirit for and toward those with whom we bitterly engage, this is Paul's focus. An appropriate question for pondering given the season we are in. I've been thinking about the incarnational presence of Jesus because everything from our theology is relational. When the Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood, as Peterson says it in the Gospel of John, the Word of God became flesh, and the relationship designed by God, and certainly the way we understand our theology, is that God gifted us with a person to be in relationship with, a person who wants to meet us where we are, to know us, to see us, to love us, and the reason is, is because in this incarnational theology, this incarnational presence of Christ, nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important than relationships. John Donne, writing in the 17th century, famously wrote that no man is an island. For our purposes this morning, I want to use inclusive language. No person is an island. Comparing people to countries and arguing for the interconnectedness of all people with God, Don said, no one is an island in, entire of itself. Every person is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, he wrote. As well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were, anyone's 
any person's death diminishes me. Because I am involved in humankind, and therefore never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Every person is unique, valuable, essential, and part of the whole. During these strange and challenging times, and particularly in this past week, I've been reflecting deeply about how it is for the coming days that I am going to experience inner peace. And so I've been thinking about what we can reflect upon deeply together today. For tomorrow marks the 50-day mark until the presidential election. And so I've been thinking about the spiritual practice of engaging each other. I've been thinking about the amount of energy it takes as we are engaging in the spiritual practice of relationships. I've been thinking about the importance of where our spirits are as we move into this next season, if you will, these next 50 days. Because I've been thinking about that talking about and listening to people with whom we disagree consumes significant energy. And I believe this is one of the reasons that many of us are absolutely exhausted at the moment. Amen? Amen. Now, for some of us, it's easier to go silent, to retreat, to isolate ourselves, and some of us are doing exactly that. We're feeling more lonely than ever. Some of us tend to hunker down and, and simply wring our hands sometimes and pray for the best. And all of us, wherever we are in this space of anxiety and looking forward in this strange and challenging time, all of us are grieving. And grief has a way with us. The practice of engaging each other is a critically important spiritual practice. And we've been talking about spiritual practices as those things that we do to keep us strong. And so we engage in the practice of engaging each other because there's nothing more important than relationships. Relationships are what interconnect us, propel us forward, help us to think and to see each other as God's own. So how is it that our spiritual practice of engaging each other might be strengthened in these days ahead? Brene Brown says, Resist the temptation to dehumanize each other. I was rereading this past week in Brown's book, Braving the Wilderness. She writes that dehumanizing often starts with creating an enemy e image. And that the enemy image often starts with language. And then in our minds, we follow it with the images we conjure up. And those images grow. And as a result of that, we become in our minds more disagreeable, if you will, with each other. It's not that we cannot bitterly disagree, but it is the spirit in which we disagree. 
Hear these words from Brown's book, Braving the Wilderness, the quest for true belonging and the courage to stand alone. Dehumanizing and holding people accountable are mutually exclusive. Humiliation and dehumanizing are not accountability or social justice tools. They're emotional offloading at best, emotional self-indulgence at worst. And if our faith asks us to find the face of God in everyone we meet, that should include the politicians, media, and strangers on Twitter with whom we most violently disagree. When we desecrate their divinity, we desecrate our own, and we betray our faith. Challenge our, challenging ourselves to see the divinity in one another requ requires a deep call to self-awareness and a disciplined sense of caution for ourselves, of what we are thinking and what we are saying to ourselves and what we are saying to each other. In every message, there is good news. As we prepare for these next 50 days, as we prepare to enter into the election for the United States of America, the country that has gifted us with so much, the country that we love and we are thankful for, I would invite us to ponder deeply what moving into deeper acts of grace, grace upon grace, the psalmist and the hymnist proclaim. I've been thinking a lot about living beyond judgment. Because you and I, good news, you and I, because we have made the choice to follow Jesus, we are in the loving business, not the judging business. John 3.16 reminds us that God is our judge, that we, our role as God's people are to be compassionate and to be caring and to think carefully and reflectively and critically about what we say and how we say it. You and I are called to see the face of Christ, as Mother Teresa would say, in every human being. I've been thinking about the importance of resisting the tendency to jump to conclusions. You know what they say about making assumptions. I've been thinking about the question, what if? What if we made the choice as believers to abandon what I've called for years the land of ism? negativism, criticism, sarcasm. I heard an author this past week say, consider this, we're not here to be right, we're here to get it right. You've heard me say before, what would it look like to live our lives as if no one can offend us? These are hard and messy times, challenging for many of us in more ways than we ever imagined, could have planned for, or even are prepared for. We're grieving. We're feeling a collective vulnerability. 
we're needing a normal. We're, in military terms, what they say is that with all that's before us, the pain of a pandemic and the journey toward a better nation and a better understanding of what it means to be a people who love each other, we're at that point of no return. We're in the messy middle. And the messy middle invites us and challenges us to live, each and every one of us, by a higher standard. And so I've been asking myself, how can I rehumanize some of those men and women whom I have decided that I simply can't stand? What would God invite me to begin to think about? How would God invite me to think more critically and more lovingly about all of us together as children of God? I've been texting more than ever during this pandemic because for those of you especially that are sick, I can't I can't visit you. I can't talk on the phone to some of you. And so I've taken to texting on a regular basis, sending light and love. As we move forward in the days ahead, I hope that you will join me in the invitation to collectively, as God's people, to intentionally think about, in every moment of our days, sending collectively light and love. Because God is love, and light is stronger than any darkness. So from our house to your house today, our hope and prayer is that together, that we will stand strong, that we will focus more on the ways that we are alike than different, that we will continue to work our hearts out for social justice, to hold our leaders and all of us who are responsible participants in our land, to hold us, make us accountable for justice and for love and for light. We make this prayer in the name of God. Amen, amen, and amen.